welcome everybody to the Learning from Leaders uh, webinar series hosted by the Yale Center for Customer Insights. We're so glad to have you here with us today. We started this webinar series during the pandemic to help bridge the gap between academia and industry, which is our mission as the Yale Center for Customer Insights. We have uh, a great talk for you today featuring uh, Barry Nailbuff, who is the Milton Steinbach Professor at the Yale School of Management. Uh, Barry has taught negotiation, innovation, strategy, and game theory at Yale for over 30 years, and he is the co-author of seven books and an online course. And he will be interviewed today by Dr. Dalian Kane, Senior Lecturer at Yale School of Management in Negotiation, Leadership, and Ethics and Dalian's research focuses on judgment and decision making. So you have a, a great uh, little panel for you today. Um, we do encourage everybody to use the Q&A function. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, we're gonna get to them at the end of the presentation. So please pop your questions in there and we will get to as many as we can. So Dalian, I'll pop it over to you. Thanks, Emily. Dalian Kane here. Uh, I've been teaching, co-teaching negotiations with Barry for some time, and uh, the theory is all his, and uh, it's been awesome to watch it develop over the years. Of course, when the book came out, I bought several copies because he's my friend, and I thought, ah, I know this stuff. I've heard it. Uh, when I actually listened to the book, uh, I learned some extra things. I just think it's required reading. I'm honestly a big fan of it. I think very rare do you get such a thoughtful book from a very smart, hardworking person who's thought so long, so deeply about it. So as you're reading, just as you're thinking, yeah, but, he says, well, you might be thinking, yeah, but, and then he answers the yeah, but. So it's just really a rich text. Uh, I love it. I once uh, asked a gal out when I, years ago when I was single uh, in Canada, I asked a gal out because she had a Barry Nailbuff book in his bookshelf, in her bookshelf, and, and it was pointed out, well, a lot of people have Barry Nail Buff books. Maybe you don't have high dating standards. Uh, well, it was a necessary, it was not a necessary nor sufficient condition, uh, but it did intrigue me nonetheless. Anyway, pleasure, Barry. Before we start on your book. Yeah. We have some. Sad nuts. news. Yeah, not great. Go. What's going on? It was a gut punch. Uh, the co folks at Coke decided that they would limit themselves to 200 of their top brands, and uh, Honest Tea didn't make the cut. Uh, they're keeping Honest Kids, which is about $500 million in sales, but Honest Tea was below $100 million, and uh, that wasn't big enough for them. Uh, they somehow also had to deal with uh, shortages in glass bottles, which is certainly a, a real issue. And uh, Seth wrote a post about this on LinkedIn, got well over a million views, a thousand comments. And I think there's a pretty good chance that uh, we'll get the gang together and uh, give it another shot and see what we can do. Yeah. So there's some they're they're not gonna they're they're gonna destroy it or sh shelve it. Maybe you can unshelve it. Uh, I don't know what they're gonna do with it, but they're taking the they're they're discontinuing it for now. By the way, we should probably take a step back. Mm -hmm. Honesty is a company I started with one of my students, Seth Goldman, back in 1998 and sold to Coca-Cola in 2011. Uh, and when Seth was running it, and then the person he picked was running it, everything was great. And then there was no longer one person in charge of Honest Tea. It was just part of a tea portfolio. Uh, and I sometimes joke that, Coke is, joke that Coke is really good at bringing uh, businesses from 100 million to a billion, and also pretty good at bringing businesses from 50 million to zero. And I'm not sure we ever managed to cross that threshold with the T line, uh, compared to the kids line. Mm. Yep, the kids is uh, so since this is a marketing crowd, before we get into your great book on negotiations, any insights? Do you want to stay on the honesty subject for a minute? I know it was an uh, uh, interesting journey. Yeah. By the way, if the folks uh, here think that we should redo uh, honesty, and uh, happy to get your take on that. Uh, we have a name that we're uh, playing around with. Uh, it's uh, three lines, uh, write down just, next line ice, and the next line T. <laughs> Justice T. <laughs> and Dalian is pretty quick here uh, on the on the draw. <laughs> so 
no justice, no tea. Uh, anyway, uh, so in terms of uh, one insight about marketing, if uh, I, I like to flip things, and often focus groups you can think of as people have their eyes closed and their mouth open because they're doing a blind taste test. And the opposite of that would be your eyes open and your mouth closed. And what I call that is a label reading test. And what I think is too many companies maximize the product based on the taste, if you'd like, or the experience, and not enough based on the label. That <clears throat> people care about things besides the taste. So in terms of label, what the calorie content is, uh, what are the ingredients? And essentially, they're willing to give up a little bit in taste to get something that's a better read. And the best example of that, of course, is Honest Kids, where if you do a taste test, 95% of kids would like it sweeter. But the parents who buy it really care about what it says on the label. Mm. And uh, I think the mechanism by which companies design products tends to be too one-dimensional and misses the opportunity to do the eyes open, mouth closed. Uh, version of market research. That's really interesting not to go down a whole behavioral economics tangent, but one thing, one of my pet peeves is people will do like a, an expensive wine, take it out of the bottle blind taste yeah. test, and people yeah. say, oh, you were tricked by the bottle. They It tastes the same uh, as this cheap wine, but the but it, I'm not sure it's that's correct cognitive, cognitively to say that they were tricked. The We get our taste experience from our from our tongue, but mm -hmm. from other aspects yeah. of our mind as well. And the bottle feeds into that and the brand yes. feeds okay. into it. And so a better branded, better bottled wine actually tastes better. Well, it's a better experience. Maybe, it's a, yeah, different, except, yeah, it, it, the experience is different. The experience is better. And you should care about the full experience, not yeah. just the experience on the tongue. Yep, 100%, so. So there you go. <laughs> uh, so what is this whole pie thing? This is the book. Everyone split the pie. Uh, I got mine on, uh, I listened to mine on Audible. Um, tell us about the theory in a nutshell, yeah. and uh, then I have a ton of questions. So Daly and I have been teaching this material to the students at Yale now for a decade. And the surprising thing is you'd expect folks when they're negotiating know what it is they're negotiating over. And in fact, that's not really the case. And because they're confused about what they're negotiating over, they end up making arguments that are uh, biased in their favor. They come up with ad hoc views of fairness, and that leads to people getting emotional. So what I'm trying to do here is put some logic into negotiation and be clear about what the negotiation is really over. Mm -hmm. And so give us a, a sense, a story, or an example where people are negotiating over the pie, especially where we can see like what people do instead or yeah. without your theory, what, what's happening. So I'll give you a fake example first that's really quick and then a, a real example. Mm -hmm. The fake example that we use to lead the book is Alice and Bob are negotiating over a 12 slice pizza. And if they can agree on how to divide it up, they get the 12 slices. But if they can't agree on how to divide it up, Alice will get four slices and Bob will get two. And a lot of people think that because Alice is twice as strong as Bob, Alice will get twice as many slices with the no deal, Alice should get twice as many slices with the deal. Therefore, you should divide up the pizza eight and four. So a proportional division, say to market cap, which is common, right? Or, or who knows what, but- How much money you're contributing to the deal. Mm -hmm. Other people think the fair outcome is you just take the 12 slices and divide it six and six. And I think both perspectives miss what the negotiation is about, which is absent a deal, they can get four plus two slices, which are six slices. With a deal, they can get 12 slices. The reason to do the deal is to go from four plus two all the way up to 12 to get those extra six slices. And then the question is, who's more important for those extra six slices, Alice or Bob? And the answer, in my view, is they're equally important. If Alice walks away, there's no deal. If Bob walks away, there's no deal. And you divide those six slices three and three, which means Alice gets the four slices from no deal plus three extra, or seven, 
and Bob gets the two plus three or five. Mm -hmm. Seems so straightforward. Can you give us a, a sense of what people do instead sometimes? So we, we talked, we, you know, we intimated on proportional division. Yeah. I mean, the natural thing is to look at something you can anchor on and say, uh, I think I've got one side is more powerful than the other. One side is needed uh, more than the other. And as a result, they claim they have uh, more strength uh, in the negotiation. And it's only it, that's misguided because they don't understand what the negotiation is really about. And once we define what I what I say to students when I'm teaching electives is once you define the pie as like the unique value of the deal that we can create together that we can't create apart, then by definition, both sides are needed to create pie. And so once you know, understand the pie, you understand you, you by definition, understand your value proposition and your power that it's equal, that you need me just as much as I need you for us to ink a deal. Otherwise, this all goes away. You still, you still could be a trillionaire without me, but the pie, this marginal add to our lives that, that we need each other for, well, that's symmetric power all the way. By the way, folks, uh, we've got the chat open, so if you want to ask things, make comments on chat, uh, please do. We're somehow able to semi-multitask. Now, Dalian, in when we teach together, always likes to tell stories about his mom. <laughs> and since I want to up, want up him, I'm going to tell a story about my mom. Uh, my mom lives in Sarasota, Florida, and uh, she was renting, and the landlord, seeing that it's a hot market from all the people working from home, rings her up and says, uh, Marsha, I'm putting the house you're in up for, up for sale, uh, and I'm going to list it at 800000 but because I like you, I'm happy to sell it to you for seven ninety. And so my question uh, is, what is the pie in this particular negotiation? What are they really negotiating over? And a lot of people think it's the price of the house, if you'd like. But I think there's kind of a market price for the house. It's in a development. There are a lot of other houses that are quite similar. So to me, that's a pretty small range. So what's really the negotiation over? He's going to save some money by not having to put in new carpets and paint the walls. She's going to save some money by not having to hire a moving company and go through the psychic castle. But the real big number is they save a 5% real estate commission or $40,000. And so the question is, who should get the 40000 My mom writes to him and says, I like the house. I'm happy to buy it, pay market price. But if we do the deal together, we can save $40,000 as real estate commission, along with some my moving costs, your refixing. So... Let's call those things a wash. And I'm happy to split the 40,000 savings with you 2020. He writes back and says, Marsha, I don't think you understand. This is a hot market. Therefore, I have more power in this negotiation. I should be getting more of the 40,000. And Dalian, what's the response to that? Well, you're not getting any of it without me. <laughs> not getting any of it without me. Also, the fact that it's a hot market is why the price is high. That's the high market price. But if you sell this house at 800000 to anybody else, you collect seven sixty. If I buy this house, uh, an equivalent house from anybody else, I'll have to pay eight hundred. So the only way to get that seven sixty to 800 gap is for you to be the seller and me to be the buyer. We need each other equally. And therefore, we should split that 40 20, 20. He gets it. He agrees. They... Uh, and then he actually gets religion about split the pie. He says, you know, why are we each hiring separate lawyers? Why don't we each, why don't we both hire the same independent lawyer? They can represent both of us here to make, you know, sort of a fair deal and we'll save another $3,000. And sure enough, they do. And, uh, they managed to close the house. It all worked. So effectively what we're doing is turning a negotiation into a data exercise and we agree up front that what we should do is split the pie so then we can make a larger pie. You know, so many questions here about how do you estimate the pie? What if you're dealing with someone unreasonable? All these things. But a first, first question is, can you go through, so what if another mom comes in or another buyer? In other words, if his power increases because his market gets better, how does that change the pie? How does it change the power? I don't think it does. It changes the market price. Uh, 
So you could say, look, what is somebody else willing to pay for this house? That's actually what we're trying to estimate. But anybody else, he's going to get four, there's forty thousand dollars lower amount of money because the real estate agent is getting involved here. Mm-hmm. And yep. in this particular case, there were five other houses on that street that had sold in the last six months because it's a development. And so it wasn't that hard to do an adjustment on the price per square foot. Uh, and maybe that's off by a thousand or two, but not much more than that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in this case, it wasn't that hard to estimate what the market price is, what somebody else would pay for this house. And so was this owner, your mom, I assume, not having met her, I assume is a smart, reasonable person. Mm -hmm. Uh, This uh, other party seems reasonable as well. I didn't hear a long protracted lawsuit in the story. But what if you're dealing with a total creep or someone who doesn't care about the theory, Yale, the pie, none of it? Yeah. So allow me to share another story with you in that regard. I have this uh, friend uh, who's kind of an idiot. Uh, he thought he could save some money by doing a trademark registration on his own rather than hiring a lawyer. And what he didn't realize is that when you file for a trademark, it has to become public. And that's obvious because otherwise, how could somebody object to the trademark if they didn't know what it was? Uh, He goes then to buy the domain name associated with the trademark and discovers that there's this troll who I'll call Edward Kahn, because that's his name, uh, who has just bought the domain name. In fact, bought it the same day the uh, trademark filing became public. So he writes to uh, Edward and says, uh, you know, uh, what's up? Uh, And Edward says, I'm sorry that uh, this domain name seems to be related to your trademark. Uh, I'm happy to sell it back to you for $2,500. Now, my friend's dumb, but he's not an idiot. And so he does some research and discovers an organization called ICANN that for $1,300 has a dispute resolution process. And what Edward has done is called registration in bad faith. And therefore, my friend is guaranteed to get the domain name back. And in fact, Edward has gone through this process several times. And not only does he lose, he doesn't even file a petition against it because why spend the effort knowing that he's going to lose? So my friend writes back to Edward and says, "Uh, look, $2,500, that's ridiculous. I'd rather go to ICANN and spend $1,300. I'll give you $500. And Edward says, $500 is too low. I'll give you uh, $1,100. So maybe we should take a pause at this point. So... Why is he so he's he's where he's at 1100 now? He's at 1100. He started at 2500. Yeah. Uh, and look, he's got to come down to below 1300. Or else because, you're not doing it. Because basically, in that case, he's going to get zero. Mm-hmm. And what do you make of that concession from 2500 to 1100? Yeah. So I consider that a concession of 200, if you'd like, because until he gets down to 1300, not negotiation down. has there's no reason no reason to negotiate with him. And so when he says 2500 he's kind of signaling that he's hoping that you don't know your yeah. options. Yeah, so he's basically saying, are you, an idi- are you an extra idiot? That basically, I'm going to try and take advantage of you, and I don't know if you know about ICANN or not. And mm-hmm. if you don't know about ICANN, I'm just going to take you for everything you're worth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, of course, that, add- that isn't adding anything to the trust factor in this negotiation. And so he's at $1,100. you are at five. Yeah. The friend? Yep. And so, so why five? Is that, do you have insight there? Yeah, but let's hold off on that for a moment. So okay. one of the lessons I've learned from Dalian, who uh, I think may have learned this from Smokey the Bear, uh, which in marketing I believe is the longest running ad campaign uh, that may exist, is don't fight fire with fire. Fight fire with water. Put out the fire. Uh, he is thir- he is eleven hundred is basically trying to get a large fraction of the pie. So let's take a step back further. What's the pie here? I claim it's $1,300. The is, ICANN fee saved. Yeah. Uh, if, if you can make a deal, you don't have to go through ICANN. You say, uh, the, your friend saves 1300 one side saves 1300 but the pie is the joint savings between the two of you, total 1300 right? So let's, let's understand this, that if there's an agreement, uh, my friend's going to get the domain name, 
And if there's no agreement, my friend's going to get the domain name because ICANN's going to give it to him. So therefore, no matter what happens, my friend ends up with the domain name. So it doesn't matter if that domain name is worth 1000 10000 50000 At the end of the day, my friend's getting it. So the only real question is, does ICANN get involved in the process on which 1300 goes out the door? Mm. And the troll has proposed a split, which is 1100 to the troll, 200 to my friend. That's not a very fair split. And a lot of people would be tempted to just flip it and say to Edward, I'll give you 200. Uh, yeah, and, you give me a crumb, how about you get a crumb? Yeah, yeah, and that's just, I think, guaranteed to piss Edward off. Mm -hmm. Because for the same reason that my friend is not going to take the 1100 deal, Edward's not going to take 200. Right. And so what we talk about in our course is this idea of a hypothetical flip. You can say to Edward, look, I don't think 1100 is a reasonable offer. And I wouldn't, uh, and it's just like my offering you 200, where I'd be 1100 up and you'd be 200 up. Mm -hmm. And for the same reason I think you would be upset about that and reject it, you shouldn't accept, expect me to pay 1100. Yeah, so that's fighting fire with fire, right? Uh, yeah. And, and that just creates a huge gap. If you're being ridiculous and I be equally ridiculous, now we have this huge gap and we're wasting time and we're mad now. Uh, so it's better to so, yeah, do something else. So my friend, at this point, you said it enough. To realize, my friend is me. Sorry. Uh, it's okay. Uh, it says, look, the pie here is 1300. Let's split it 650, 650. And uh, I'm 650 ahead. And you are 650 ahead. Uh, so first what Edward has done is he's tried anchoring at 2,500. Then he's tried to see if he can get most of the pie. And now what he's doing, his next move is he comes back and says, what about 900? Uh, 900 is essentially halfway between 1,100 and 650. It would have been 875, but he's just rounded. And so the question is how to respond to the 900. Okay, we made some progress. And a lot of people think in this context, well, how about just 700? Just, you know, move up a little bit. Just kind of, And I'd say you're playing the other person's game, that side. That the 650, 650 is a principled stand. And so I didn't respond at all. I didn't even write back to him. And a week later, he says, okay, I'll take the 650. Now, as you pointed out at the beginning, Edward is a guy who doesn't care about fairness and doesn't care about the pie. He knows you do, or at least it's reasonable that you do. <laughs> yeah, I've shown I do. So therefore, why is he taking this deal? Because if he doesn't, he gets zero. Right? Yeah. Uh, and so I've offered him something fair. Yeah. And he's offered things that are unfair. And essentially, he's playing arbitrary, and I say principle beats arbitrary. And so it's not that you need the other side to accept the pie theory. Uh, what you need to do is persuade them that you do and they don't have anything else. Yeah, I often say to students, it's not the theory of the pie that convinces the other side. It's the pie itself. What I mean is, you know, the, the Edward doesn't go read your book or watch your videos and say, oh, Barry was right all along, 650. It's as you're not responding, he's thinking, wow, maybe I've been too greedy. If I don't get Barry back on the line, I may lose it all. And, you know, 651 is off principle, right? right. And so if you give that inch, you're going to give a mile. It's I often notice in your class, you say, you know, when you look at a map of Canada, yeah. and you say, like, the, the, the borders are often on rivers or clear dividing lines. Like, here's where we can Parallels. make a stand. Yeah, parallels, like 54, 40, or fight, and not, not another inch out of my cold, dead hands. Yeah. Uh, now, there, this is, uh, I'm imagining this group has heard a lot of behavioral economics. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we're doing here is actually going against something that you often hear in behavioral economics, which is to anchor. So Edward tried to anchor, and I think that backfired. Because not only has he lost any trust with me, but... Since he started 2,500, he has to move from 25 to 11 to 9. The guy shows he's spaghetti, that he's just throwing stuff on the wall, seeing if anything will stick. He's jello. Uh, and therefore, I can't really believe anything he says. I shouldn't believe anything he says. Mm -hmm. So when you start with an unreasonable in initial point, not only can you create the fire versus fire effect, 
But also, you're going to have to make big movements, which then lead other lead the other side to think you've got more big movements to come. Yeah, so in referring behavioral economics, so some of the crowd may have heard these type of experiments, but these, these clever experiments where they'll say, you know, how long is the Nile River? Is it less, is it shorter or longer than, and throw some crazy random number up there. And they show that even crazy random numbers affect people. Um, and Barry and I don't dispute that. High anchors do affect people, except in the experimental context, part of why you can get away with a high anchor or a ridiculous number is you it's a you don't think it's affecting you you think it's a random number and while it's affecting you subconsciously it doesn't offend you that yeah. the wheel has spun on 50 million but if barry and i are negotiating the price of a suitcase and he says 50 million not only is that not random it's offensive it's ridiculous i'm going to walk away and so uh, it's a totally different thought process. Yeah. So I worry that while high random anchors may work in some experiments, they're dangerous in a negotiation where things aren't perceived as random, they're perceived as intentional. And, and also, something. just let's do the other. You did the high anchor. Let's look, I'll take about the low anchor. If you're selling your business and somebody says, I'll give you 140000 for it and it's worth five hundred, it's like, what? You're trying to steal it from me? Yeah. You don't uh, value the business. You're the then, wrong buyer. And then you say, look, I have another offer for 400 and The guy says, okay, 420 It's like, wait a second. You just offered me 120 Were you just trying to steal it from me? What kind of person are you? Right. And so all, there's a lot of signaling that happens when you try and do an anchor. That is not the case from these behavioral decision experiments where it's just changing what your perception is. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, uh, and I got some answer from the book, but maybe the audience could hear it, but one of the things that struck me about your book is how thoughtful it was uh, and give me a little better sense of the origin story. Was it from, I was surprised that the book suggested that you were teaching it in Yale, but that the, the negotiation with Coca-Cola really uh, kind of blew up the theory for yourself. Yeah. Give us some origin story there. For you. Uh, well, I was thought that it was malpractice for a school of management to have people graduate without any experience negotiating, since that's what they're going to do for most of their life. And we didn't have a core course in it. So when we were redesigning the core curriculum, uh, I managed to sneak in a class which had four classes on negotiation, a course. So it was this little, little bit, but make sure we get something there. Uh, and then it was a question of how do you have a principled approach as opposed to telling anecdotes giving people tricks that when the other side knows, go away. What's something that could be the Yale School of Negotiation, where we focus on the ant society, we think about how to make the pie bigger, allow people to take advantage of their natural empathy, curiosity, in ways that uh, allow them to be successful negotiators as opposed to uh, acting like jerks. And so we had the theory of the pie. Uh, it basically comes from game theory, comes actually if you go back far enough from the from the Talmud but you know it's like all right I'm teaching it we're doing it in the cases and uh, Seth and I had the opportunity to sell our business to Coca-Cola and that we sold 40 percent of the, the company at one stage and the other 60 percent will be sold three years later during those three years Coke would be helping us with production with distribution with marketing and they rightly said they don't want to have to pay more for the business due to all the help they're providing, which I have to say was a pretty good argument. And the question is, how do we resolve that? And so their initial view was they shouldn't pay a penny more as a result of all the help they're providing. And I explained them the theory of the pie. And my view was we could get to X without their help. With their help, we could get something above X. And so... It's true that we couldn't do it without them, but they couldn't do it without us to being the vessel to help. We need each other to get sales above X. Therefore, they should pay half price uh, for sales above X. And our goal was to create sales above X. That was creating the large pie. And actually, in the first hour of our negotiations, we agreed on that framework. Market price for sales up to X, half of market price for sales above X. Now, we fought and disagreed over what X was and what market price is. But ultimately, those were data-driven exercises because 
There were a lot of other deals out there. We could see what market price is. And we had to talk about what forecasts were, reasonable forecasts and projections for X. If your forecasts are wrong, can you write it in the contract that you just share the pie, whatever it turns out to be? Well, we were sharing the pie, whatever it turned out to be, mm. but we didn't know what X was. So oh, I see. You don't, and you don't really ever know what X is. Now, we, did, we could have written in the contract and should have that we'd adjust X in the event there was a recession, of which there was. Uh, and so that actually was very painful to us. Uh, so our sales ended up tripling over those three-year period but they could have quintupled. Uh, if, uh, I, I, I welcome the group to hit their questions and we'll take them. We've got another 20 minutes or so. So get, so get your questions on, in the line at least. Um, maybe it could be in the book or moving away from the book, general negotiation mistakes that you've made or you see smart people, like not stupid people, but what are some mistakes that smart people make out there? Yeah. Uh, so we've talked uh, about uh, one already, which is the fight fire with fire versus fight fire with water. Another mistake that we've talked about is the aggressive anchoring uh, and how that just can piss off the other side, can force you to have to make large moves. So let's try and avoid both of the activities. I think another common mistake is what I'll call the Miranda rights. People think in negotiation, it's as if you have the right to remain silent and anything you say can and will be used against you. And therefore, you shouldn't reveal what it is you're interested in uh, because it's going to cost you. Uh, the negotiator's dilemma. Yeah. And uh, then people also say you should listen more than you should talk. Uh, well, it can't be symmetrical. <laughs> it can't be symmetrical. I mean, that is, I want to understand what the other side is interested in but I want them to understand what I'm interested in. So I think you should listen and talk equally. And it's important to share people what your motivation is, what are your goals? Because another lesson I've learned from Dalian is I want to give the other side what they want. Not because I'm nice, although I am nice, but because if they get what they want, they're gonna to want to do the deal and so I can get what it is that I want. Similarly, I want them to give me what I want because then I want to do the deal with them, and they don't know what it is I want. So then you say, well, okay, here's the big problem. If we're all honest this way, then people are going to get pushed to their reservation price. Uh, and that's why I think I want to start negotiation, not by talking about price, not even by talking about interests, but by talking about how we're going to negotiate. Can we agree up front that we'll split the pie? And then I don't have negotiate to watch my back. Negotiate the process. Negotiate the process. Yeah, and some breaks, uh, and and like let's and let's go back to our corners, take breaks. Let's negotiate some of the, and timeline. I, you know, you mentioned not let's not negotiate um, price up front. Uh, someone came into my class, uh, Jim Wilkinson, who uh, you know in the movie Too Big to Fail, Topher Grace played him. He was uh, one of the negotiators for the Alibaba IPO. He said something interesting. He said. When you're taking over a company, one of the top priorities is controlling the phones or, or controlling social media. That when you're doing a merger or takeover, maybe a hostile takeover, it can really get spin out of control if the employees are tweeting about it in the meantime. He said, so my one of my top goals is control the phones, but that's not what I start the conversation with because it's so antagonistic and right, it's a win-lose issue in some sense. Well, at least it's it's antagonistic. And so he, he he clarified for me, like there's things that are important, but that doesn't that doesn't necessarily dictate the order of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Right? Sometimes you talk about the weather not to build rapport, not because you care about the weather. And so there's an ordering of things. And what I often teach is money is often contentious because it's valuable to both sides. So it's rarely an elegant trade. So money is important to both sides, but let's talk about it much later. Let's exactly. expand the pie first before we try to divide it up. Yep. And before we talk about expanding the pie, let's talk about what we're going to do with the expanded pie so I don't have to watch my back. Now, here's the craziest thing. And if you go back to that negotiation with Edward, I revealed to him what my BATNA was. Hmm. I said, look, it's paying $1,300 to ICANN. And he a knew, lot of people but... think 
that if once someone knows my bat, now I'm going to be pushed right against the limit. I'm going to have to pay 1200 1100 because they know any deal is better than no deal. However, once you understand split the pie, you can hold firm and say, look, I know I'm willing to do this deal at 1100 but I also know you're willing to do it at 200 So let's cut the BS and actually both end up getting half the pie. And so you're not anywhere near in danger of revealing what's going on when you've agreed up front that you're going to share on what you create. Yeah. Uh, lots to talk about here. Let's get the audience in. Jay sure. says, advice on negotiation tips when negotiating with folks who show, you know, they're basically gaslighting and they're, they're, they're saying that North is South. Well, Dalian, you're the poker player here. Uh, <laughs> so maybe I can uh, get a little time to think about that while you're getting a start. All right. Um, I mean, a few basic tips. It depends on the behavior. But look, when it, I like to say whenever you get caught with your pants down, take a moment to pull them up, right? And so if someone surprises you and is just being unreasonably unreasonable, look, you shouldn't need to come to a Yale professor for this advice. It's not rocket science. It's my biggest failure as a professor uh, in that I, I, I found it surprisingly hard to get my students to do this. The this is to take a break. Uh, and you just did it because <laughs> you're good at this. Um, but um, you all knew that one of your biggest moves in a negotiation is to walk away. And I think, but no one does it enough. And I think partially because you're imagining walking away forever rather than what I mean, which is walk away, gather your thoughts and then come back. And so when someone's confusing you or gaslighting you, get out of the room, but, but, paint a way back, not only for yourself, but for the other person. So you don't say you're an idiot. I don't want to deal with you. I'm out. See you never. You just say, you know, I I'm a little confused here. Let me work on my numbers because I, I really want to work out a deal with you and leave. But now you can come back and, and sometimes maybe make an offer. So they have something uh, because it, it might not be a trick. They might actually be confused themselves and they may need time to marinate. You may need to offer them some pie like, hey, hey, uh, Edward, 650 is better than you're going to get. Um, so here's the 650. You have a week to think about it. Why don't you stew on that and maybe calm down? Anyway, now uh, thoughts vary. Well, a couple. One is uh, Herb Cohen, who I, uh, I think is one of the masters here, often suggests calling out the behavior and labeling it. And oh, so, like uh, nice. And they give you a crazy high offer. You say, hey, nice anchoring. Like Nice anchoring. Off. You know, I, I learned about that. Uh, <laughs> You know, or if they're good, cop, uh, bad cop. good, good job with the nibble there. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you teach me how to do that? Uh, <laughs> and so it's a little bit of humor. Uh, I remember one of our uh, in negotiations, somebody was playing good cop, bad cop and told the other side, you're how lucky you are to be negotiating with me because the person who normally is in this job is a real hard ass. Uh, and the person just responded, uh, well, you're lucky because my wife isn't here. Uh, which was basically a way of saying, hey, I see what you're doing. I'm, uh, I'm going to call it out, uh, and now let's get serious. Uh, so to the extent that uh, you want to share your understanding of this behavior, your, your interpretation of it, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. Another is it's an argument to talk ahead of time about how you're going to negotiate. And so if you've agreed up front, you're going to create a big pie and split it, and they start doing this, you can say, you know, time out. I thought we agreed that we we're going to negotiate in this different way. So if you want to go back to the ultimatums, bluffing, anchoring, whatever, yeah, I can do that, but I didn't think that's what we wanted to do. Now, of course, if they don't agree to do that, you know who you're negotiating with right up front, in which case you may have to take the Miranda rights more seriously. Yeah, it's always good to, I have a habit of, um, I'm a pretty smart person. I'm not so good when I'm confused. I think I'm like, everyone's bad when they're confused. I think I'm worse. Uh, and, and so I just have this habit of if I'm ever confused in a deal or someone's confusing, I just take, I refuse to step forward until I'm unconfused. In other words, let's say I'm offered you 450000 a very fair price, and you're saying, no, it's got to be 700000 I could pay more. But I'll say, you know, something like, hey, Barry, I, I can pay more. I'm not going to tell you my limit. But 
but tell me why I need to. I, I, I don't like you seem insulted, and I worry I'm being gaslit here. That 450 is a crazy offer. I certainly don't mean it to be crazy, but first, take me through your thought processes. What what's like? Help me understand. Unconfuse me. Why is 450 unacceptable to you? And once I understand that, then I'll move forward. So when someone's gaslighting you, just stop, take a break, demand to be uh, put the fire out. <laughs> Uh, uh, before you, before you proceed, yeah. I like that word, unconfused. We have to. Uh, it must be Canadian. <laughs> Let me get one uh, from the Q and A chat. Manasi, thank you so much, uh, Barry, for speaking today. One question I had was, how do you discover mutual incentives during a somewhat difficult negotiation, especially with someone you may not know? For example, a new roommate or investment banker who you've not worked with in the past. Does it require questioning assumptions about the individuals, etc.? So. You know, it ties into how do you figure out the pie when they're not showing their cards, especially with a new person. What do you think? I think that's the whole point of the conversation is to say, look, why are we coming together? We believe that we can do something together we can't do individually. And so if we can agree up front to create a large pie and split it, then we can focus all our attention on what is it that you want? What is it that I want? Mm -hmm. uh, and be much more open with each other. So uh, I think the answer is that, and is a key point, is you can't discover what the mutual incentives are all by yourself because the word mutual implies it's both of us. And too many people come in thinking, I'm going to put myself in the other person's shoes, but it's me in their shoes, not them in their shoes. And so yeah. what I really need to understand is what's motivating them. Uh, and I don't think they're going to be as open until they appreciate, one, that I'll be open, and two that they're not going to get taken advantage of once they start sharing what's going on. If we're really successful in this, the people in the negotiation will say, wait, that didn't feel like a negotiation. That felt like a joint problem-solving exercise. It felt mm -hmm. like we're on the same team. So in particular, I don't want to think of the other person as my opponent in this. That's yeah, more a, like a partner. Uh, yeah, and I, Nick Eppley has uh, an interesting book, uh, MindWise, where he talks about most people don't bother to take perspective, but even when you try to take another person's perspective, we're just not good at it. Like he's tried, he's ran lots of experiments. It's, it's almost impossible to do so. You should just ask. So I always tell people, you want to know what do they want? Why? In what order? Is this a need or a nice to have? And it would be great to know how much they'll pay for these things, but that's a rude question. You'll never, you'll, they, they won't tell you their budget, but at least the first two, what do you want and why? Help me understand your problem. If you find something valuable to you and cheap to me, I'll help you solve it. And, and to that question, let me add one thing. Even a person you've known and have negotiated with for the last 50 years, don't assume that their problems from two years ago are the same today. They've just been through a pandemic. They've been through a change in the in the stock market. So, so you should check this. Everyone's new every time you meet them. So Tim Marion, uh, who, who we know, uh, has a question. The domain name issue is very specific because both individuals have a unique interest in the product, like the domain. How valuable is the pie uh, method? Sorry, just one extra comment on that. Okay. Uh, Herb Cohen has this line. Uh, you know, people ask about negotiations across cultural, cross cultural negotiations. And his point is that at least there, I have some understanding that I may be having trouble communicating. Whereas when I'm talking with Dalian, I sort of assume he's the same as I am. And actually, we can get even more danger there because in fact, he and I aren't the same person. And so you should assume every negotiation is cross-cultural. Uh, no matter how, uh, it's just some don't always appear that way at, front, at first look. Yeah, and with a, a new version of you. It's like a yeah. new person every time, yeah. Yeah, so how valuable is the pie method, Tim Marion asks, when negotiating a commodity, something that can be bought from another seller, but there, it's not really a liquid market for it. So if I'm the buyer, should I search and find a seller that is more accommodating to the method? Or talk about pies in liquid commodity markets. Yeah. So if it's truly pork bellies, and there's a price in the stock market, you know, New York stock market, uh, there's a bid-ask spread, which is pretty darn small, uh, for price of NVIDIA or something like that. Uh, yeah, there's not a lot of negotiation there. I think actually my mom's house examples are a pretty good case of this. Because in some sense, the market price of the house was actually kind of a commodity. There was very little room for debate on that. 
all the action was really the illiquidity part of it. The real estate agent commission, the moving costs, the fixing it up. And so mm -hmm. essentially, if those illiquidity aspects are substantial, that's what the pie is all about. And then can you get somebody who's willing to share the illiquidity pie, if you want? Because the price part of it, if it, if it were totally liquid, there is no pie. Because I can essentially replace any buyer or any seller. That's what it means to have a commodity. Uh, the, 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 any two people do not create special value. So the question is, why is this pair creating more valuable more value than any other pair? And it's because they have some better way of handling the liquidity. So in my mom's case, they didn't have to hire a real estate agent. They didn't have to fix up the apartment. She didn't have to move. Those were liquidity costs associated with selling the house. Let me give you two questions from chat, and one just mull over a little bit. Arun asks, and I think you may want to marinate on this one, like how you would negotiate next time around with Coca-Cola if you had the opportunity to get Honest Tea back. And the question uh, from uh, Jim Firestone, uh, he's a board member at YCCI, asks, yeah. Uh, splitting the pie makes sense if you're both equally interested in a deal, but oh, this is the big question you get, right? What happens if one side is more motivated than the other? Uh, or t the flip is, I, what if one side says, I don't need you as much? You know, yeah. uh, you're a hundredaire, I'm a trillionaire, let's go. So actually, I, I don't buy this story a little bit of the one side is more interested in the deal than the other. That is, the deal creates some value. And uh, you can't say that one side creates more value than the other uh, or that one side is more interested. There is a pie that is available. So uh, let me take an example from Honest Tea in this case that uh, Coke had the ability to buy the same bottles we were using. We were paying 19 cents. They were paying 11 cents for the same piece of plastic. So that's an 8 cents a bottle savings on 100 million bottles. That's $8 million. So you could say, well, okay, for honest tea, you know, that eight million, you know, that's a huge number. That's an unimaginable size number. Whereas for Coca-Cola, it's not even a rounding error. It's not material on a rounding error. So Coke could have said in proportional division, look, our sales are 40 billion, your sales are 20 million. So that's a 2,000 to one ratio. So we'll split that eight million. We get 7,996,000, you get 4,000. That's almost a reductio ad absurdum to the proportion argument, right? Yeah. Like, it shows that proportionality can't actually make sense because if it doesn't make sense here, it doesn't make sense in general. And even Coke didn't think that was reasonable. So like, okay, we'll take seven, you get one. And I said, well, look, we're equally valuable here. And Coke says, well, we're bringing our buying power. What are you bringing? And the joke answer is our inefficiencies. The more serious answer is our customers who enjoy drinking this lightly sweetened organic beverage in an overpriced bottle. Without our customers, your buying power, you've already applied your buying power to the 40 billion in sales. You want to apply it to another 20 million or another 100 million bottles? You need us. And then to Jim's point, they say, well, okay, Barry, you don't understand it. We'll do seven, you get one, because basically that one million means a whole lot to you. It's super important. And so we need to get seven to get the same gain as you would get with a one. To which my response is, well, wait a second. You just told me you don't care about money. And if you don't care about money, Why then you know, we'll it? take the seven. You can have one who will notice. So in some sense, if the other side is less interested in the deal, all right, so that means they can be more generous. But can you agree on what this deal is over? How much money is, what's the size of the pie? And the fact that in some sense one side cares more than the other, to me, is not an argument they should get more than half the pie. And even if you don't rely on their charity because they don't care, we can point to you. You're caring a lot. If there's two sides of that. You might be desperate for a deal, but you also work harder to improve the deal because each incremental dollar matters a lot to you. So you will fight hard. Yeah. And, and you should think about not just what you're getting in a deal, but what you're giving up. So if you think about the 7-1 split that Koch might have proposed, Honest Tea is giving up seven million out of the eight. Coke is only giving up one. So why is it that the side that cares more should be giving up so much more? Exactly. Let me uh, let me give you one last question to wrap up, and I'll remind. I think Arun had it. 
And you can think about like, what would, it doesn't have to be actually rebuying honest tea, although it could be, it could be a reflection of what you would do differently. And uh, given that this was years ago and you've learned a lot since then, but how would you do it now if you tried to get the company back from Coca-Cola? What, well, what have we learned? Well, we did ask for it back. And yeah. the challenge is that they're keeping honest kids and therefore they care about the honest name. No. And so therefore, at least for the present, they seem unwilling to allow Seth or Seth and I to run with Honest Tea. But you've already, you've already, you've already, tell me you've already got the web page for Justice Tea. I have the several domain versions <laughs> of it. I do indeed. Uh, uh, that pause scared me for a second, but I was like, <laughs> uh, no, no, I, uh, <laughs> once uh, I learned that lesson the hard way. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, would I, would we have said, look, if you ever abandon this, you have to give us back the name? Yeah, maybe we could have put that in, but I don't know. Uh, I think instead I might have worked a little harder to try and find some ways to ensure that we had uh, somebody actually always in charge of the brand rather than the brand just being part of a uh, larger consortium. Uh, but ultimately, I, I think the pandemic was relevant here because of the shortage of glass bottles. Uh, right. Now, that, that was an argument why they couldn't put everything in PET. Uh, I think they could have. Uh, I threatened last question, but I've got a last, last one because it hits on a question that's so common when I teach negotiations. This is a very popular question. So from Sanjay, last question, building on what Barry asked about cross-cultural negotiations. With trade happening across so many borders these days, uh, negotiations may not be as open. So he's imagining dealing with someone who just by their cultural nature is maybe less trans, not less transparent, but let's just use the word open. So how, how can we use negotiation tactics there when someone is a little bit more close to the vest? Yeah. And let me see if I can answer Nancy's question too about inequality aversion in the process. Mm -hmm. well, which yeah. is, I think everywhere around the world, people want to be treated fairly. And we know from experiments on the ultimatum game, that's a game in which you divide up $100, one person proposes a split, say 80-20, and the other person just says yes or no. Now you think if I offer somebody 20 bucks, 20 bucks is better than zero, but people turn that down all the time because they just think it's unfair. Mm. And... Uh, and that's true for people. That's true for capuchin monkeys, where they've done experiments where one side gets one monkey gets grapes, one side gets cucumbers. Cucumbers are fine, but not if the other grapes. monkey is getting grapes. <laughs> so, uh, so Sanjay says, how can I use negotiating tactics that may work in one's favor? I'm going to push back against that and say, I don't want actually something that works in my favor. I want something that's going to lead to a fair outcome. Because if I'm getting more than half the pie, the other side has to be getting less than half the pie. And if they figure that out, they're going to be pissed off. Because I don't know any culture where people like getting less than half and being treated unfairly. Um, and so, the, and, and we talk a lot about zero-sum negotiations. Uh, well, actually, negotiations are never zero-sum. Because if you don't reach an agreement, you both get zero. And therefore, there's no pie to split. And so you could say with my mom or with Edward, you know, 1100 versus 200 or 650, 650, every extra dollar I get is a dollar less he gets. But if we don't reach an agreement, that whole 1300 disappears. If my mom and the seller don't reach an agreement, the $40,000 disappears. So reaching an agreement is an essential way to have negotiation work in your favor. And the way I want you to have that negotiation work in your favor is to offer something that's truly fair and explain what that means up front. So uh, I don't think you have to worry about, in some sense, different backgrounds. I think you explain to people that I want to be treated fair and I expect and I plan to treat you fairly. And let me explain what that that means. Yeah, and you can start, you can lead by example too. You can say, if, they, if the person is uncomfortable with your questions, you can say, I see you're uncomfortable. I don't mean to be asking anything personal. I'm not asking your budget or anything like that. I just mean, what does a deal, perfect deal look like to you? What, do you? what are you trying to do here? And then lead by example and tell them what are your goals and take turns. And so I would say 
that information exchange is is key, as Barry said, but sometimes you have to sell it differently. Mm -hmm. And in some cultures, you have to be gentle and take turns a little bit at a time is usually wise. Uh, we Across cultures, we often care about pie as much, but the way you go about getting it and selling it are different yeah. uh, from person to person and culture to culture. Yeah, actually, that's why with Edward, I didn't start with 650 because I figured he wanted to see some movement on my side. He didn't think my first offer was going to be my best offer. And so it wasn't the first thing I started with, but I got there pretty quickly. Yeah. Thank you so, so much, Barry. Good luck with the book. Anything else you want to tell the crowd about? Uh, you know, I mean, you're blowing up in Coursera. You have over 400,000 students, students and, and students, too. Students. And I think this, are you top three, number two? I, well, rated? the rate, the instructor rating is 4.95 out of five. But these folks are tough graders, so I'm not sure I want them. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> so split the pie. Uh, you can read it. You can listen to it. I 100% recommend it. I get no money out of this. Uh, and I don't recommend many things. I just think it's required reading if you do deals. Thank you so, so much, Barry. And thank you, Emily. Thank you for all your questions, everyone. Thank you, Daly. And thank you, Barry. Everybody have a great day.